Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. I'm Pastor Craig Kavinsky and we are studying the revelation of Jesus Christ in our Revelation Bible Study. It's good to see a nice group of people here tonight. Thank you for joining us. We have uh, one new person and we seem to have a couple of new people every week. Last week we had two new ones and the week before we had some new ones. It's good to welcome uh, Devon, who is the youth pastor of the Nepali Christian Church. Is that Nepali, the full? Nepali Hosanna Church. I'm sorry? Nepali Hosanna Church. Nepali Hosanna Church. And we are so glad that he is with us tonight and all the rest of you. Thank you for joining us. And how about if we open with a word of prayer? Lord, as we open the Bible tonight, we pray that your word would just light up in our eyes and that the Holy Spirit would guide our conversation and guide our attention, our focus, so that we would see and understand and be able to apply what it is that you have for us tonight. We are grateful for all of these brothers and sisters, men and women all over, uh, not only this church, but several other churches that are tuning in and following, uh, that have contacted me and thanked me for this study, and thanked me for the ministry of this church, that we are preaching and teaching and, and communicating the Word of God uh, 24 7 365. And so, Lord, we pray that you will be honored and guide us now by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I am beginning with a quotation from Dr. David Jeremiah. I'm holding the book up to the camera first, and you can take a quick look at this. This is, Is This the End? Dr. David Jeremiah, Signs of God's Providence in a Disturbing New World. Some people have asked me, why do we have a tribulation period anyway? Why don't God just judge the people and be over done with it? Why do we need this seven-year period? That's one question I'm getting a lot. Another question I'm getting is, who is the tribulation for? Is it aimed at Israel? Is it aimed at the church? Is it aimed at the Gentiles? Or is it aimed at somebody else? So there's a lot of confusion still buzzing around, not in this group, but outside of this group and people I'm talking to. Uh, clarity seems to be scarce. So I am going to make it super clear and I am going to let Dr. David Jeremiah in two passages answer all those questions in two paragraphs. He does a real good job. Listen to Dr. David Jeremiah. He says, The overall purpose of the tribulation will be to exercise God's wrath upon those who oppose him. First, upon the Jews who have rebelled. As we have already shown, and then upon the rebellious Gentiles. As Paul wrote, quote, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's Romans 1.18. Second paragraph, Dr. Jeremiah says, We like to think and speak about the love of God, but not so much about his wrath. But wrath goes hand in hand with judgment, and it is as much an expression of his goodness as is love. In fact, love and wrath are two sides of the same coin. One who is infinitely good, as God is, rightly abhors evil, because evil is the enemy of goodness. Evil is, in fact, like a parasite, a blight, or a cancer, on goodness. It feeds on and thus <coughs> destroys goodness. Therefore, God rightly directs his wrath at evil. That's the best explanation I've ever read in a very brief way on the purpose and the unfolding uh, plan of God in the tribulation period. That's page 276, and that's Dr. David Jeremiah. Is this the end? You have one of our church members to thank for this, because somebody just gave me this book, and I went, wow! And I started reading it, and I came across this, I thought, i got to share this. That is what the tribulation is all about. Now, I have an announcement to make. Last week, um, I made a statement, and uh, I made an error, and uh, 
I checked out the error, I checked out the information that I said, and I found out that I was incorrect, and I wrote a disclaimer on Facebook on the church website. And if you haven't seen it, that's okay, because I'm going to say what it is right now. I mentioned that uh, Family Feud, uh, Steve Harvey, had passed away. And everybody said, or some people said, no he didn't. I'm like, yeah he did. I read his obituary. And I did. And they said, I don't think so. So I went home and looked it up, and it's a hoax. Okay, Steve Harvey is reportedly alive and well. The YouTube obituary was a cruel, unkind hoax. My apologies. I even have the date of his death. Because it was a whole obituary written out, and it was just a, a lie, just a hoax. And I read it, and I was like, oh, okay. I mean, who, who makes up obituaries? Yeah, what kind of nasty. craziness is that? Mm -hmm. So my apologies, and uh, I am going to eat a piece of humble pie. Watch. <laughs> I humble, I bow, okay? And if I make mistakes, point them out, let me know, and I'll go home and look it up. And if I'm wrong, I'll confess it. And if you're wrong, well, that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're opening our Bible, and we're in Revelation chapter 18. This is the fall of Babylon, and we talked about Babylon a whole lot. And just to review real quick, when we're talking about Babylon tonight, we're talking about the world system. Get that. We're not talking about the Babylon in the Old Testament. We're not talking about modern Babylon today. We're not talking about the Babylon in first century Palestine. Because Babylon's used a number of ways, a number of places, a number of times. In the future text of the apocalyptic literature, in this chapter, we're talking about the city that represents the world system. And the world system is the system of falsity. It's the system of error. Someone said, ignorance of scripture is the root of all error. And it is. And that's why we're studying the word of God, so that we can know and understand, apply and live the truth. Okay? So I'm reading, I'm going to read verses 4 to 8, unless I have a reader. Would someone like to read 4 to 8 for me? Nice and loud for the recording? If not, I'll read it. Pam. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are reaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquity. Pay her back as she herself had paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am the widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and phantom, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Okay, so who is the she in this passage? <clears throat> Remember what I just said? Yeah, it's talking about the world system. This is called a personification. Personification. You hear the word person <coughs> in personification? They're giving the world system a personhood, and it's a female personhood in this text, okay, and it's this woman, but the woman is the harlot, the woman is the prostitute, the woman is Babylon, the woman, all of that is this false, erroneous, deceptive, lying, cheating, unethical, cruel lie. That's what it is, and that is the society that is the time that precedes the Lord's coming. Now, some of you will say, well, that sounds like today. In a lot of ways, it does. We fit the bill in a lot of ways. Because how many children understand and practice respect with their elders? Not too many, not so much. What's happened is our society has devolved. Not evolved. Evolved means building up. It has devolved, that is going down. 
I believe we are the smartest generation that's ever lived, but I also believe we are the most pagan, decadent society that's ever lived too. Wait a minute, you say, what about them Romans? They were decadent, they, have, they had orgies. Well, you don't think there's orgies here today? There are. We have a terrible, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a terrible place, morally. And um, some people want to say, oh, everybody's good and everybody's nice and, you know. And, and this is one of the untruths from some psychological, psychiatric perspectives. Now, all you know I do counseling. All you know I have a state license. And all you know I do uh, psychotherapy. But I don't do psychotherapy according to lies. I do psychotherapy according to truth. I will tell no one an untruth, not intentionally, but a lot of people do and will, and um, so that's, that's that world system. Okay, so on the top of your sheet, look at the word, page three, word remembered, and that was from verse five, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Underneath of it, it says, God chooses to remember the wickedness of the unrepentant. God chooses not to remember the forgiven sins of the repentant. Isn't that good news? Matt, is God going to remember your sin if you confess it, forsake it, and he forgives it? No. Exactly. <laughs> That's what this says. It's exactly what it says. Walking down the steps of divine forgiveness. You see them steps? And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through Scripture... And I want everybody to please walk with me. We're going to start at Psalm 97, verse 10. And then we're going to walk forward through the scriptures. And we're going to look at a number of verses. And I, if I could have some readers, that would be real great. Those of you that are listening at home or somewhere else, this is Psalm 97 and verse 10. I'm going to wait till you all get there. The good news is we're not going to bounce around the scripture. It's going to be one journey from left to right forward. Psalm 97, 10. I'll read it. Debbie? Oh, okay. Though you who love the Lord hate evil, he preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. So somebody tell me what the application of that is for us. What does that have to do with us? We are what? We are supposed to do what? Love the Lord. Love the Lord. We're to love the Lord. What's the first part of the first verse say? Hate evil. Hate evil. We're to hate evil. Can I ask you something? Do you hate evil? Yes. Do you? That's good. We're to love what God loves and hate what God hates. And God hates a lot of things, and you're going to see it as we go through the scripture. And you know, we got to be careful because the devil is a deceiver. And I read something recently where a person said that Satan is not dressed in red. He does not have horns and a tail. But he can come to you as everything you've ever hoped and dreamed and wished for. That's scary. Think about that. Pay attention. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to God. Because there's a lot of voices that are speaking today. As a matter of fact, the airwaves are crowded with voices. And I'm not talking about radio and television. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit is being drowned out in some people's lives by demons. Satan has an army. Make no mistake, he is not alone. A third of the angels fell with him. How many? I don't know. Whole bunch. Millions, I think. And they're the ones that are going to march on Jerusalem. Speaking of Jerusalem, has anybody read anything recent, say, within two weeks, of some of the good things that are happening in Jerusalem? Benjamin Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu was recorded by a Christian Broadcasting Network. I listened to it this afternoon. Some good stuff is happening. Anybody hear anything? Read anything? Know anything? Recent. Tell us. Embassies. 
Jerusalem is being built up just as scripture prophesied. That in the last days, that's Isaiah 2. That's not in your notes. If you want to write this down, you may. I'm going to read Isaiah 2 real fast. But um, Israel, excuse me, Jerusalem is being built up. How many foreign embassies do you think there are in Jerusalem currently? There are now five. And I was listening to the president of two different countries, and I'm sorry, I forgot their names. Uh, I'm sorry. But if you want to hear this, you may. Go to Craig and Pam. Craig, letter N, Pam. And I posted this on my uh, Facebook page, and you'll see Benjamin Netanyahu and some other people about these embassies. It's only three or four or five minutes. It's real short, but it's really, really good. Okay? It shall come to pass, in the, I'm reading Isaiah 2, 2, Isaiah 2, 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall follow it and many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And I could go on, but I won't. That's Isaiah 2. Um, and if you listen to this uh, presentation, Christian Broadcasting Network, um, you'll see that these nations, one of them is from Africa. I can't remember the name of the country, but it's on the tip of my tongue. You know, they want to build an embassy in Jerusalem because they believe that Jerusalem is the navel of the world, the belly button of the entire planet, because everything seems to proceed out of Israel and out of Jerusalem in particular. Jerusalem has been the capital of Israel for how many years? You know your Old Testament history? 3,000 years. It's never been contested. It goes all the way back to uh, David and Solomon, where the, it was established in 1,000 B.C. as the capital. And it has remained the capital. And um, was it... I won't go there, but in Jerusalem, there are five foreign embassies currently, and there are more that are coming. Because they want to get on the bandwagon... Because I don't know if you know it or not, but agriculture is leading the world in uh, the study of the uh, usage and, um, how do I say this, the uh, usage and uh, distribution of water. Who is agriculturist? Yeah, it's in the Negev. Oh. There's a university in the Negev, and I went and looked at it, not personally, but um, there's, I think it's called, it might be called the University of the Negev or something like that. And they are recognized as a world leader. Uh, Israel has three deserts. And Israel is leading the, the industry of how to preserve and, and use to the fullest extent water. Well, they live in an arid climate. They are a barren nation. There's a lot of rock. There's a lot of sand. There's a lot of dust in most of Israel, except the north. And that's the Golan Heights that they just won back in the Six-Day War. And um, Galilee, which is gorgeous. Galilee looks a lot like Pennsylvania. <laughs> Believe it or not, it does. It's it, it rolling hills and, and mountain uh, flowers. You know, our Pennsylvania state flower. How many of you know what it is? It's the mountain laurel. Mountain, mountain laurel. laurel. I just posted that uh, uh, on the internet with uh, a comment about the youth group, believe it or not. The, the thing, family night, I was saying that it's growing and expanding uh, in a beautiful way, just like the mountain laurel of Pennsylvania. And then I posted a picture of the mountain laurel. And uh, so Jerusalem is really getting built up. Embassies are trying to come in and be part of this new development. Saudi Arabia 
is in the mix of uh, uh, establishing closer relationships with with Israel, and Israel is being recognized probably today by more countries than, than ever, the way I'm understanding it, the way I'm seeing it. And, and that's a great thing, and that fits with prophecy. That fits with what we're studying. So we did 97.10. Let's do 103.12. 103.12. <clears throat> Who'd like to read 103.12 for me? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Some of these are very key verses about biblical forgiveness. And when we talk to people about forgiveness, we should be able to quote or point to some of these verses. As far as the east is from the west. Now we're going to go to Isaiah 38, Isaiah 38, and we're going to read verse 17. Can I have another reader for Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 17? Oh. Dottie? Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. But in love you have deliver, delivered my life from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Did you hear that? You have cast all my sins where? Behind, behind my back. Your back. I like that. What a vivid picture of God uh, handling our sin. <coughs> Thank God. And let's go to 4325. 43 and verse 25. Again, talking about how God handles our sin and where we are as a result of it. Isaiah 43, 25. Who'd like to read that for me? Okay. Um, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Blots out. Blots them out. <clears throat> scratches them out. Stamps them out. Beats them out. Blots them out. Aren't you glad? I am so glad, and I will not remember your sin. How about Jeremiah? Next book, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 4. If you have children, I hope you're sharing the word of God with your children in addition to Sunday school and, and the junior church and all that. These are some good verses for, for kids to know, too. Because we're all sinners. Kids too. Okay, we're in Jeremiah chapter 31. And the title in my study Bible says, The Lord will turn mourning to joy. Mourning as in uh, uh, sadness. Okay? And who would like to read 31.3 for me? Another reader. You may read twice in here. I will build you up again. And you... Virgin Israel will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your temple mm -hmm. and go out to dance with the joyful. That's not 31.3. That's 31.4. I thought you said four. Did I say four? Yeah. It's four. what it says right here four. on the sheet. Four. Four. Yeah. On the sheet it says four. Oh, I changed it on my sheet. I want three and... I'm, I beg your pardon. I want three and four together. Start with three and then read four again, please. Let me do that again. <laughs> the Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your tendrils and go out to dance with the joyful. Make no mistake, God is not done with Israel. I get very angry when I hear some people on TV and other places say, God's done with Israel. God, They had their chance. They blew it. Now is the time for us. I've heard preachers say things like that. And I'm like, no, that's not so. Don't you read the book of Romans? Didn't you read Romans 9, 10, and 11? 
God has a place for Israel, and the tribulation is as much for Israel as it is for the Gentile nations, because the scripture teaches that God will burn away the dross and the, the impurities in our lives. And when the millennial kingdom starts in chapter 20, and we didn't get there yet, okay, it's going to be mostly Jews and Gentiles. It'll be a mixture, but it's going to be in Jerusalem, okay? You're not going to find a majority of Polish people. <coughs> I'm Polish, by the way. I can say that. <coughs> or Germans. I'm not, I am partly German, too, uh, on my mother's side. It's mostly going to be Jewish as other people, to other nations too. And so God is purifying Israel during the tribulation period, and they are called to remember what I'm going to get to later in the text, the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, and other passages. Okay, so there we see God loving us with an everlasting love, and he's saying to old virgin Israel, again, you shall Adorn yourself with tambourines, and you shall go forth and dance the, with the dance of the merrymakers. I believe that's in the millennial kingdom. That's what I believe. I don't believe it's happened yet, because Israel was um, a nation, but uh, they don't all believe the same thing. I've been there three times, like three groups, and, uh, you know, I find that the various camps of divisions within Judaism are very, very... Uh, very broad and very different. There's not a unified spirit we're all sitting there waiting for the Messiah. Some of them don't even believe in a Messiah, and some of them redefine what a Messiah is, as in not being a person, but being something else. But in the future, it's going to be different. Okay. I, that was Jeremiah 31, 3 to 4. Change that in your note, 3 to 4. And the next passage, change that one too. That should be Micah 7, 19, not 17. Let's turn there. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Right after Jonah. So, timbrels or tambourine? I'm sorry? Timbrels. I, I, they might, that might be the same word that... that what it's referring to might have a couple of different words that, that describe it. Timbals, tambourines, I'm not sure. I'm guessing at that, I'm not positive. Anybody have a thought on that? Okay, you'll go with that? Okay, good. <laughs> I got off the hook on that one. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Probably the same thing. All right, I found Jonah. You know where he is, right? In the belly of the fish. <laughs> okay, I found Micah. We all got Micah? Yeah. Hard to find Micah. He's a small book. And we're looking at chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 19. Micah chapter 7, and verse... I'm getting, trying to get there. Hey, that's the last chapter. Would you like to read it? 19, right? Yes. Yeah. He will again have compassion on us, and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. <clears throat> isn't, that, isn't that amazing? And there's two other passages on your sheet. We don't need to look at those, because you know what they say, right? John 3, 16 through 18. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's what it says. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, on the left-hand side of your sheet, uh, opposite Psalm 97, I want to give you four passages of Scripture, and I want to look them up next. These are not on your sheet. So you got that left-hand margin. It's a pretty big margin. So can you do that? Can you number from one to four and leave a little space in between each? And then I'll give you all the passages at one time.
Okay, the first passage is Proverbs 6.16. Proverbs 6.16, we're going to read it. And then, um, well, I'll give you all the passages at one time. The first one is Proverbs 6.16. The second one is Proverbs 8.13. Proverbs 8.13. The third one is Amos 5.15. Amos 5.15. And the last one is Romans 12.9. Romans 12. And verse 9. So we're going to start off with Proverbs 6.16. Last one is Romans 12.9. Yes, Romans 12.9. We're still talking about forgiveness and how God feels about sin. That's the subject we're in. Because it says that God is going to remember if you remember back to the text in verse uh, 5, it says, For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So we're reading verses that saying God's going to cast our sins behind his back. He's going to throw them in the deepest sea. He's going to set them as far as the east is from the west. And he's going to remember them no more. How come God will do that for us and not for them? Because we have repented put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save us. She, that whole world system, has not. They have refused to repent, and this might sound a little bit uh, terrible, but they actually curse God. And it says that in the scripture. I can show you places uh, where they do that. Okay, Proverbs 6 and verse 16 is the first one. You know what? Hold on. Let's do 16 to 19. Mm-hmm. Proverbs 6, yeah. 16 to 19. It's, you don't want to stop in the middle of a verse. That's why I'm changing it. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Who would like to read that for me, please? Faith? There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. That basically describes the last society in the Revelation. That's pretty much what's going on. And that really is an abomination to God. It really makes him uh, sick. So that was the first one. The next one is just a couple pages over, which is eight. 13. Would someone like to read Proverbs 8, 13? Debbie. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. So there you go, folks. That's pretty black and white, isn't it? God hates sin. We need to hate sin. Now, some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, gee, Pastor Craig, we all hate sin, don't we? We're all Christians. We all love the Lord. We all hate sin, don't we? Well, do we? Pastor Jensen shaking his head, no. Tell us why not. I, I agree with you. Tell us why. Well, um, I, for example, I don't like injustice, okay, except whenever it fits me. Ah. And I want to be unjust towards someone. So I want to get the activity plays a part in it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know that's that sin. High in it. Yeah, that's sin. That's wrong. But I'm saying, it, you know, theoretically, I'm against these sins. I dis- despise evil, except when I take pleasure in it, I slip, and then I can't say that that's the case for that moment. Hmm. And you know what? You know what I find a lot of Christians doing? You're going to be uh, surprised when I say this, but this is bigger than you think broader than you imagine. I find a lot of Christians flirting with the devil. I find a lot of believers flirting with evil. I've had some people tell me, you know, I'm struggling with lust, but I don't look at nudity. I just look at pretty women. But So it's okay, right, Pastor Craig? No, it's not all right. Well, they're, they're not naked. They're dressed. So if they're dressed, it's, you know, even though I'm lusting after them, if they got clothes on, it should be okay. And I say, nope. They're flirting with the devil. They're flirting with evil. Mm -hmm. 
You cannot do that. I cannot do that. You cannot do that. We cannot do that and call ourselves Christians. Because we are making ourselves into hypocrites. Nobody wants to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a hypocrite, you know. I'm sure you don't. But you know, when we if if we flirt with sin, if we kind of say, uh, oh well, yeah, my son uh, did do that. You know, if there's a conflict in the neighborhood and you get a neighbor knocks on your door and says, you know, your son, little Bobby, <laughs> did such and such, and uh, and you take up for him and say, well, little Bobby is a good boy. You know, little Bobby, little Bobby, this, little Bobby, that. And, Instead of manning up and acting like a man or a woman, depending on who answers the door, <laughs> it's a lady, don't man up, just woman up. <laughs> and woman up, man up, what does that mean? Take responsibility and discipline your child and apologize to your neighbor and make sure it doesn't happen again. Don't flirt with the devil and take up for your kid and make him right no matter what because you are not doing him a favor. You are teaching him how to lie and how to deceive. And no parent wants to do that. But we do it. And we've got to be careful here. I'm waving a flag, a big one, on, on this one, the flirting with the devil. Because I'm seeing it a lot. And I'm hearing it a lot. Okay, so that was Proverbs. Did we read 8.13? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We did. Okay, yeah. good. Fear of the Lord, hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, the way of evil, and perverted speech, I hate. Amos 5.15, please. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, remember them Old Testament books? You're ahead of me. <laughs> I'm cheating because I have a thumb index Bible. You know, if you don't have a thumb index Bible, are you aware that you can buy them little tabs and put them in yourself so you can get to the book real quick, much quicker if you, if you desire. So we're looking at the book of Amos. I hope I got the right verse here. Okay. I do. I think that's what I was trying to get at. 8.15. Give me one second. Okay, good. Yeah, that's that's the one I was looking for. Would someone read Ain't now hold it. I'm in Hosea. No wonder that didn't look right. Two more, more, went, two more books ahead. <laughs> <laughs> when I prepare for this, I look all these verses up, highlight them and underline them. And I'm like, I didn't highlight this one. All right. My apologies. Ho Joel Amos. All right. I apologize. All right, we're in Amos five fifteen. There's Amos. Hello, Amos. Okay. I'm getting there, folks. I'm Polish. you gotta be, got to be patient with me. Ah, I got it. Somebody read Amos 5.15. Debbie? Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Okay, very good. So that is uh, some Old Testament passages, and uh, Paul picks up on this in Romans 12, and we're going to look at Romans 12, 9 uh, before we go on. I hope you go away from this tonight thinking, you know, I've got to be a little more careful about my speech my attitudes, as well as my actions, to make sure that I am not flirting with the devil. So that's what I'm doing. i got to make sure that I'm walking according to the word, and not w walking according to my own emotions. And that's possible to do. Pastor Jensen mentioned about the fact that subjectivity comes in there. And sometimes we mix up emotions and faith. You know, and we have to walk by faith, not by sight. And some Christians walk by emotions, not by sight. Well, if you're walking by emotions, you're on a very dangerous trail. Because emotions can lead you in any direction 
and you can get somewhere that you don't want to be and you didn't want to go to before you know it, unawares. Because you have an enemy, as I do too, and he is a deceiver. And he can make left look right, he can make right look left, he can make north look south, and he can make south look north. He can really disguise things and mix things up a lot. That's why God calls us to be discerning, to be careful, to test the spirits, to look to the word, to pray diligently, to talk to other believers, to talk to other godly people that you respect and you appreciate their encouragement, their guidance, their advice. Um, because we're up against a deceiver that has a track record that is unbelievable. I mean, think about it. Satan was an angel. He was working in heaven, living in heaven. He was thrown out of heaven onto earth. And he knows God probably better than any of us. He doesn't know forgiveness. He doesn't know grace. Because salvation hasn't been granted to angels as it has to humans. But he has a lot of knowledge because he's seen things that you haven't seen. He's seen things that, that I haven't seen. And he's seen things that none of us will ever see until we get to heaven. Because he's already been there. Have you been there? I haven't. I don't know anybody that has. But Satan has. Never forget that. Remember that. That's why he's such a crafty deceiver. Because he's got a whole world full of, of knowledge of things that we haven't even seen. And we will one day, but not today. Romans 12, 9. Who would like to read Romans 12? Let's see. <clears throat> Who would like to read Romans 12, 9? Good. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. He's picking up on all these Old Testament passages. Paul was a Jew, you know. And so he knows the Old Testament. He knows the prophets. He knows the word of God in the Old Testament. And he's just echoing what's been previously written, that we are to hate evil. Does anybody have any questions on anything I've said so far? Okay, we're going down to repay 6 and 7, and we're going back to Revelation 18. In your left-hand column in large letters, I recommend you write God the Judge in the left-hand column, because that's what this is all about. And I'm going to read John MacArthur on um, Remembered. It says, God does not remember the iniquities of his people, but does remember to protect them. For unrepentant Babylon, there will be no such forgiveness, only judgment, only wrath, only punishment. Okay? Now under repay, that's verses 6 and 7, pay her back as she herself has made, paid back others, and pay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen. I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. Talk about prideful. Talk about arrogance. Huh? Can you see the pride and the arrogance in this world system? I sit as a queen. I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. In other words, the world is saying, in this future generation, evil will never touch me. Cancer will never touch me. I'm protected. I'm preserved. Do you think you're better than everybody else? I am better than everybody else. That's the attitude here. Do you see that? Can you get that? Okay, listen to John MacArthur on that. John says, the angel calls for God to compensate wrath to Babylon in her own cup to repay her according to her deeds. This is an echo of the Old Testament law of retaliation from Exodus 21, which will be implemented by God. And so we're talking about God the judge giving to uh, the world system what the world system deserves for resistance, rebellion, and refusal to listen to and obey the word of God. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? 
Go back over to Romans 12. Keep your finger there in Revelation 18. We're going to read 12, 17 to 19 now. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, 17, 18, and 19. We'd like to read those three verses, Pastor Daniel. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I wrote in my notes, believers are forbidden to seek revenge. Because God said he's going to take care of it. Yes, and we're also off the hook, too. We don't have to mill that around in our mind. We can trust by faith God will take care of them. And I don't even have to deal with that. I volley it over the net to the Lord. How about it? Make no mistake, folks. Everybody is going to get exactly what they deserve. Whether good or bad, blessing or curses, God is impartial. God is not deaf. God is not blind. And God sees all, all the time. That's right. Mm -hmm. There is no reason to presume that anybody, anywhere, is going to get away with anything ever. That's right. They're going to pay for it in this life or the next. And that decision is not yours. It's not mine. That's God's decision. Because God is God. And we have to be okay with that. We can't argue about this. We can't debate about this. We can't have a comeback. we got to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we've got to pull back, stand down, cease and desist, and glorify our God, and let him do what he chooses. Amen. You're not God. I'm not God. We're not God. Let God be God. Amen? You believe that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good. This is an example of Babylon getting what Babylon deserves. Now, it says, I'm back in Revelation 18, and I'm looking at verse 6 again. Pay her back as she herself has paid others, um, and repay her double for her deeds. Double. Interesting, interesting. John MacArthur says, has the sense of full or overflowing, the punishment will fit the crime. The punishment will fit the crime. That's the point, I believe, that's trying to be made there. And I have an illustration there for Jeremiah 16. And I'm going to turn over to Jeremiah right now and read verse 18. Isaiah, Jeremiah. And we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 16. And I'm going to read verse 18. And, and Jeremiah 16, 18 says, But first I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land with the carcasses of their detestable idols and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. So you see, folks, people today think they're pulling one over on God. They lie, they cheat, they steal, they rape, they murder, they rob. You know, the mafia in New York, which is a real thing, lived there for a number of years and pastored in there. Pam and I could tell you stories, but I'm not going to go into it now. But every Saturday night, we had a, we had a weekly car burning. And uh, we lived next door to a graveyard. And about 9, 9.30, there come the sirens. And we know who they are and why they're coming. Because there's another car that's parked in front of the graveyard that was torched. And this went on week after week after week. And the police are well aware of it. And this is all part of the uh, Brooklyn uh, crime uh, families. At that time, when we were living there, there were three active crime families in Brooklyn. And one of them owned a, gr a drugstore chain. Uh, we shopped in there a couple times once. So I'm like, oh, it's really? I didn't know that. You know? They had, um, uh, what did they call them? Pam, down on uh, 84th Street. Uh, I, t 
told you a story. I went in, I went in, knocked on the door one time, and stuck my head in there. What are they? What are they called? Um, well, there's a name, for, you know, but that's where some of these guys go and hang out. No lights, no door, you know, nothing to advertise anything. But the whole neighborhood knows. I mean, nobody's unaware. And I'm pastoring a church on uh, 86th uh, Street. I'm pastoring uh, Metropolitan Baptist Church, Metropolitan Baptist Academy. We had a school from K to 12. Both our sons were in that school. And uh, I thought, you know what? I'm going to stick my face in there and see if I can talk to them about the Lord. And I opened the door and stuck my face in. There was a bunch of them sitting at this table. One of them got up and said, he didn't say a word. He just shook his head. So I backed up and shut the door and walked away. <laughs> wow. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Where's the bathroom? Was there a bathroom in here? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, but seriously, I did that. And, you know, if they'd have been a little more inviting, I would have went in. But he got up and started walking toward me. And he goes, okay. Shut the door. I bet I can figure out where you didn't park your car either. <laughs> <laughs> One time I was sitting in front of a uh, funeral parlor, and this was on 84th Street, and uh, I had to go in. I was visiting somebody, and I parked right in front of it. You know, I figure I'm a clergy, you know, I should be able to do that. And I had somebody with me, and this black limousine pulled up behind me. And the person that was with me from my church said, move your car. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so I put it in here and moved it. Uh, that was reportedly some of the family. And I don't mean the family of the people. I mean the family of Brooklyn. Oh. I didn't see these people because I went around the block. I'll get out of here. So I went around the block. But we had a mafia family live right next door to us. Not next door to us. Next door to the church parsonage. Because our parsonage was on uh, 85th, right, ma'am? 84th was the big road, then it was 85th and 86th, right? So it was one block behind the main road, and they had this marble place and had marble columns and had balconies on it. The church parsonage looked like a, you know, do-it-yourself, put-together little house <laughs> next to this thing. And... Uh, and one year we had vacation Bible school, and this family had, had two children. Was it a boy and a girl? Me. Two, me, two boys. Two boys. Well, I went up knocking on the door, and I did it during daylight hours. <laughs> <laughs> Go over there at night. <laughs> I don't want to assume anything. But like, <laughs> plenty of light, plenty of sunshine. And a lady answered the door, and uh, presumably the mother. And I said, Hi, I'm Pastor Craig Dubinsky. I'm Pastor of this church right here, Metropolitan Baptist Church, Metropolitan Baptist Academy, and we have a children's program on Wednesday night. And I'm telling her all this stuff, and I said, We got vacation Bible school. We'd like your kids to come. No charge, it's free. She looked at me and she says, Okay. <laughs> and then she shut the door. And I'm like, Hmm, what does that mean? Well, guess what, Pam? Tell them what happened. Do you remember? Oh, the boys came. Yeah, the boys they came to vacation Bible school for five days, wow. and we shared the gospel, and wow. we treated them two children like we treat any child, you know, because they're just children. They're not mafia members. They're just kids. They didn't kill anybody or bury anybody or torch any cars. At least I don't think so, because they were kind of little. What were they, like six, seven, or eight? Yeah. Something like that, like elementary school children. And, you know, we shared the gospel, and we shared everything, and... And we never had any problem with that family. They were very quiet. They were not flamboyant. Y'all know the name John Gotti? Remember him from the news? Yeah. Yeah. He was Mr. Flamboyant. He is the opposite of everybody in the mafia. In the mafia, they're all very quiet, closed-lipped. Right. They try to keep to themselves. They don't want to attract attention. And John Gotti was quite the opposite. He's got flashy suits, and he's prancing around Brooklyn and Queens, and, you know, going into restaurants with his... Put his ten carat diamond on, you know. He's, you know, Mr. Uh, Extravagant. That's not what the mafia does. That's not what they look like. That we saw. They're, 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 you know, if you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. 
just don't park in my space. <laughs> <laughs> wow. yeah. So those were fun days. Those were fun days. Yeah. All right, we're in Jeremiah. I got to wrap up soon. We're in Jeremiah 16. We read that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, 16, 18. I wrote in my page, God will severely punish the polluters. God is wrathful against sin because sin, uh, against sin because God hates sin and sin is everything that God is not. If you think about it, what is God? Who is God? What is God like? Let me give you four things. H, O, L. What am I going to say? Why? Why? <laughs> God is holy. He is not like us. You know, he doesn't do things like us. He is a holy God. And he is calling us to holiness. He says, be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. And he's calling us to live a life of separation from the world, separation from sin, and separation to him. Separation to him alone. And that's why prostitution is used as a metaphor for idolatry all through Revelation, because what is idolatry? Idolatry is giving your attention, giving your affection, giving your heart to a person or an object other than God. Well, that's plus plain wicked. You're all breathing, right? I'm breathing. Where are you getting your oxygen from? Oh, we get it from the air. Where are you getting your air from? We're all getting it from the same place. God has given us this lovely planet and all the water and all the mountains and all the lakes and all the trees they told Adam and Eve to keep the garden when they were in it. Of course, you know, he threw them out. This is what they did. And, you know, we are called to fill the earth and subdue it. That was the, that was the Adamic mandate, you know, to, to, uh, to work the garden, to work the earth, and to fill the earth, and, and to subdue it. Subdue it means to control it in a healthy, productive, and positive way which is what Israel in the Negev is doing about the water. There's a, I can't remember what they called that. I looked it up one time before, but it's a, um, it, I think it's part of the University of the Negev or the Negev University where they're doing a lot of studies on the preservation and usage of water. Okay? Uh, to my knowledge, they came out with the idea of doing <coughs> underground watering. How do you grow flowers in a desert? Well, you don't grow it by spraying water all over the place. Because if you spray water all over the place, the sun will just dry it up, and the flower won't get much of anything. Yeah. But if you do underground watering, which they do, then the <laughs> roots get the moisture, and the sun doesn't get the evaporation. And they do a lot of that. They're very good at that. And that's what that's all about, about the water. Okay, it's 8 5. I'm going to stop there. When we come back, I'll pick up the verse 7, and we'll be talking about uh, I am no widow, I sit as a queen, which is down the bottom of your sheet. Any questions before we close? Let me ask Pastor Jensen to close us in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the uh, information, but also, Lord, the transformation that we receive from your word. And we thank you for uh, Dr. Craig and his willingness to teach and just the way he puts his heart and soul into his study and the presentation. And I thank you for each one that joined us here tonight in person or somewhere else remotely uh, through the internet. Lord, we just pray that we will go from this place better equipped to serve you. For those of us that are going home, give us uh, safe travels and route to that place we call home. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.